Welcome to Melt University. This series will help you build your brand, inform you on a variety of career paths, and introduce you to top executives in sports and marketing. Now, here's your host, the president and CEO of Melt, one of the largest independent sports and event marketing agencies in the country, Vince Thompson. Welcome students, Virtual Melt University. We are rolling into the spring, spring break hopefully, uh, live classes. We're hearing uh, green shoots, maybe some SEC football. Um, and so uh, we're, we appreciate all the amazing comments and feedback we're getting from you guys. We're trying to figure out the summer intern uh, program, uh, but we have, a, we have a very special guest today. And in, in, in the spirit of we talk about uh, relationships and relationship building, relationship maintenance, um, and, you know, how, you know, Frank and I go back many, many years, um, and uh, we've always just stayed in touch and, and, and the spirit of building relationships. But Frank Bracken is the CEO of Foot Locker, uh, which, as you know, he is leading uh, a major transformation through digital. We're going to talk about <clears throat> consumption habits. We're going to talk about uh, how that has created, um, you know, opportunities, new opportunities for this new generation of consumer and coming out of a post-COVID world. Also uh, came up through a traditional brand management uh, background. We've, we've, we've had a lot of enlightenment about what a real true brand manager is, had a huge and successful career at, you know, Miller and then the Coca-Cola company, which is where we met. And then he joined uh, the Foot Locker uh, organization, Champs, Champs Sports has steadily risen up um, the ladder to being the, the, the CEO and a, and a major player in the space. And obviously the sneaker phenomenon and all, just a lot of really crazy things are going to impact, but also Frank, Congratulations on the University of Michigan. I, really, what a great story. And, yeah. uh, you know, we might have to sneak off to the Final Four together again. I, I like the sounds of that. I mean, timing's everything. I was holding off on doing this podcast till we had some good uh, collegiate <laughs> news to celebrate. So here we well, are, a Big I Ten mean, title. I, I, it's just so great. I mean, I, you know, what, a, what an amazing story. And, 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 uh, and Jawan and, and maybe Harbaugh can take some, uh, some notes from um, – from uh from from uh from juan but uh but tremendous tremendous story and we know uh we know michigan nation is uh is very very uh very pleased to see uh you know them on the rise into into the big dance albeit it's going to be somewhat of a of a different big dance this year but um but nevertheless hopefully we're having big dance this year we didn't have it last year but you know you've had you've got tremendously successful career uh, so far, and you're still rising and, and climbing. But before we dive into any of that, I always we always like to throw it back to where this uh, where this passion uh, was originally established for success and for business, maybe through sports, maybe through brand management. I mean, again, you work with some vaunted brands, Miller Brewing, Coca Cola Company. Uh, you know, Champs, Foot Locker, uh, and, and all that. Uh, but so where did your original sort of drive and passion? Because since I've known you, um, you know, you've always, you know, always uh, strove for excellence and, and, and no matter what you did, but you never took yourself too seriously either. So where did this, where did this passion come from? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably chalk it up to three different things Gr growing up and probably attributes that I've kept up until, you know, this conversation today and hopefully for the next 10 or 15 years of my career. But one has always been competitive, you know, whether that was academics or sports or, you know, playing a game of cards, that idea of competitive spirit has certainly uh, driven me I like to have fun at the same time. But, but being competitive and winning is important Two, I've always had a curiosity about people. And, and that's what drove me into marketing, I think, and hopefully made me a successful marketer and brand marketer is curiosity about people wanting to understand behaviors, where their mindset is, where they're going next, you know, what are the things they're looking for, how to make them happy as a customer. And then lastly, you know, just getting along with people, which kind of, you know, intersects the two of those things. And, and sports is an important part of that and learning how to be a part of a team, whether you're the leader of the team or you're the wing man, the wing woman. Uh, I, I think those are important lessons that you can learn in the formative years and they carry on and are, are certainly super important as you as you enter your business career and as you get into more senior levels uh, of your career in the organization, it really becomes a people management game. And so being able to understand and read the room or read the Zoom 
uh, and, and pick up on body language and how people's moods are and what they're saying uh, is really, really important. So I think just, you know, those three, three things have been common themes along my, my career arc. So, um, and, and, then, and then going to Michigan, and here's one thing we talk about, um, that the, the obviously tremendous business school, tremendous training, tremendous academics, tremendous ath- uh, athletics, but, but we talk about, uh, we talk about the, 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 the campus is the ultimate professional laboratory. Were there things that you did when you were at Michigan or Georgetown or Melbourne um, that really sort of prepped you to get into the quote unquote real world? Because we're going to talk a lot about the tumble cycle and things that you look for and aspiring, you know, employees. But, but, but how were you able to take advantage of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing is. You know, I, I grew up and lived only 45 minutes from the Ann Arbor campus and, and didn't spend too much time, if I'm being honest, until I, you know, went to school there. Uh, went to some games and hung out with some buddies a, a little bit, but it wasn't obviously until I enrolled in school that I spent, you know, time there. And just being exposed to that many different people from that many oh, different right. walks of life, it attracts a very international sort of student body, a very sort of broad domestic, you know, there are a lot of Northeasterners and New Yorkers and Long Island, but there's also a lot of kids from California and Washington State. Yep. Oregon it's well. it's an international school. school. So, yep. Yeah. So just, just meeting and being around people who came from different geographies, different nationalities, different income levels was, you know, I grew up in a pretty middle of the road, suburban suburb of, of West Detroit, Not, nothing too glamorous and nothing too bad about it. It was a, a great childhood, but just, you know, that was my first entree into a bigger world. Right. And then from there, obviously, you know, in, into my first job in consulting and traveling, that, that obviously opened eyes and took me to different places too. But to answer the question, yeah, I mean, I, I, the people, the variety of people and, and the different walks of life and exposure and building friendships with people who are different than you know, my friends from Livonia, Michigan and Stevenson High School was, was number one. And then obviously just the academics and the, and the menu of things that you could choose from. I mean, being able to build your own courses and build your own curriculum and pick, you know, hey, I pick business, but, you know, my friends were in engineering, my friends were in liberal right. arts, they were in, on their way to dental school and law school and all kinds. So, you, you know, it was just an amazing opportunity to learn and challenge yourself and, and just see how people responded differently to that. Well, and then you go, we, quote unquote, you go through a traditional brand management, but what we've, you know, we've interviewed a lot of your former colleagues from Coca-Cola and, and, and very successful and who've gone on to very successful careers. But, but the term brand management is actually a misnomer. I mean, you're basically the CEO yeah. of an organization within an organization responsible for, uh, for P&Ls and all those types of things. That role is not going to change even uh, post COVID. I mean, you, you, if you, go through the, you know, the, 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 the master of business and, and then you get into a brand management. I mean, you basically are a general manager, are you not? Yeah, I think, I think that's what attracted me into that career in the first place. And I think it still holds true today that those are sort of great general manager, great CEO prep roles. I mean, you you were thinking about everything from the P and L and the revenue and the margin to marketing and acquiring new customers. You're thinking about innovation, uh, innovation and yeah where, where where's the future of growth and how do i get into new channels new geographies attract new segments of customers so it, it it's between consulting which i did actually for for six or seven years and then brand management those were two of the greatest experiences you could ever right. ask for just because they're so multidisciplinary they're so challenging they take you you know again everything from operations to hr to innovation to technology to marketing it it covers the gamut so I, I would certainly say that a lot of my success and where I've gotten to has been, you know, through the experiences I've learned and, and the hard knocks of both brand management and consulting. Yeah. And, and here's the thing here. So here's a question. Um, you, you're running a, a multifaceted um, consumer retail company, the changes and the shifts in, in purchasing habits and consumption habits were already rapidly accelerating. And mm-hmm. then we all wake up on the same day, basically the week of March 16th and all of our worlds kind of get rocked at the same time. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, I don't go to Linux mall as much. I don't go to Phipps Plaza as much. So, so being in the chair that you sit in and, 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 and what I want to tie it back to as well, because, you know, this, this generation of, you know, my son and your kids are going to be the most sophisticated generation of consumer ever digital natives, 
Uh, their purchase and, and consumption habits are completely different, but mine have shifted overnight. Like I said, I hadn't been to Linux in a long time. I get things delivered to my door, foods delivered to my door. I stream instead of going to a theater. Um, you were already in the middle of that transformation within, you know, organization because you had, you know, both with Champs and Foot Locker, just amazing brand equity. Mm-hmm. Tons of brand equity, particularly for me, I've been shopping there for years with my son and had that emotional attachment by taking them in there and buying their shoes and all that. But I, did anything prepare you for the for the 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 for the the rapid acceleration of what happened overnight? I mean, what if? And then how does that tie back into opportunities for this generation of work of, of workforce? Yeah, I don't think anybody could say that they were prepared for what happened a year ago this this month. That that's for sure. Now, right. having said that, I'll tell you, you know, retail is an interesting beast, right? Because there are those surges of activity around things like Black Friday and the Big Six holiday and Easter holiday, you know, that give us a sense of okay, what's it like to be intense for three days or for seven right, days, right. you know, whether it's promotions or a surge of traffic and, and retail business. Now to s- sustain that for 90 days, 120 days, obviously unprecedented. So right. the, the thing the thing that we learned about ourselves is just the, the premium and the, the, uh, the value of flexibility, being able to flex your operations and flex your people uh, in the back of the house to be able to shift gears as quickly as possible. You know, so from a from a business commercial standpoint, we we're able to you know close down our stores within a 48 hour time period, crank up our website, crank up our promotions online, and move the business online. Um, and and we were able to you know for the most part successfully service and, and transact with those folks. Now the unintended consequences are the the supply chain and freight delivery and UPS and all FedEx. Now they weren't prepared for all of that, right. so we, we certainly. We got a little bit of the whipsaw effect as we went further down into the operations, but the, the front of the house held up really well. So, you know, combine that with people working from home, right, for the first time. So, you yeah. know, back to the good old days of, of Coke and, and Miller, I mean, w- w- that's the people business, right? I mean, we're big companies, but at the end of the day, we're making people happy, whether it's a Coke and a smile, whether it's a cool pair of sneakers, you know, it's about relationships with customers, it's about relationships with your teammates. So to not be in their company, you know, for a week, four weeks, four months, now a full year is, is tough. And I that think that's tough, the other yeah. thing I learned is that, you know, the value of culture, strong corporate culture and relationships, that pays a lot of dividends. And, and now we're cashing some of those dividends in because it's been a year since I've seen some of my closest teammates and, and friends from work. So right. uh, I, I think that was another big lesson learned. So when, you know, I guess the point being, when, you, when you're building your career, you know, think about being more flexible that, you know, it used to be a, I want to be a real specialist. I want to specialize in PR. I want to specialize in social media. I want to specialize in, in manufacturing. I think versatility is really important, not just from a functional technical, but also just from a leadership and a management style, being able to flex and accommodate different scenarios and working with different people. That That's number one. And then number two is, of course, pick a, pick a company, pick a, pick a product, pick an industry that you have some passion that you can connect with. And, and you, you of course want to work at a place that's got great, great ethics and, and great value and purpose, but also just that work culture, because it's so important and you're going to lean on it in the hard times as much as you're going to enjoy it in the good times. Well, you know, we all remember that. Um, and, and, and mentally, I was prepared for this to end on Memorial Day. Remember flatten the curve and yep. we're all going to be back. Right. And the summer's going to be back. And and then all of a sudden, here we are finding a year. But it's interesting, too, because you manage a large workforce. I manage to work uh, a workforce. I, I, I saw I, I was seeing a couple of things. One prior to the pandemic, I saw a, a lot of the younger generation had a higher expectation of, 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 of themselves and they were going to be the CEO overnight. I mean, mm-hmm. Frank Bracken is, is an overnight success. It was just a long ass night. And so, <laughs> and, and so, and so it went overnight, it went from a seller's market to talent to a buyer's market for talent. The other thing is, 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 is that this generation had really never been in the tumble cycle. So like, you know, being married, having kids, having a divorce, having a mortgage, I mean, you know, aging parents and those types of things. And so I, I think long-term, I think this is going to have a, a positive outcome for this generation of the workforce because um as you said there was no handbook for this but 
you know, running my agency, I was struggling from a generational perspective. And so, you know, because if you hire somebody and then they leave after six to 12 months, I mean, it's hard to explain to them the replacement and retention cost and, and you know, the vacuum and, and they are benchmarking leaderships. But, but from where you sit, because I do think it's going to be a great renaissance for this generation. I think there's some, ap- some empathy, some, some humility has been inserted. They are very bright. They do have, they, they were driving uh, consumption uh, patterns. Do you see that? And, and what advice, because as you, as you noted, and I know this about you and same with me, we still are willing to do anything it takes for our customers, our consumers, our fans, our clients, our suppliers, our vendors, and 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 um, that's a philosophy that will serve this generation well, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I picked up on that too. And it's hard to tell folks who are early in their career who have been successful academically in sports and social circles to have patience, number one, and let your career develop over time and take advantage right. of opportunities and learn skills and take those horizontal moves to, you know, build a skill or give you an experience rather than just look to always kind of climb the ladder. That, that's, that's a hard message to process and, and follow that advice. Very. And then Very. secondarily, you're right. I mean, you pointed it out is that adversity builds character. It builds experience. It builds calluses. It builds your ability to deal with situations. And so again, this one, no one asked for it and no one predicted it, but clearly uh, there, there's a silver lining. And I think it's how you adapt. It's how you form relationships. It's how we're communicating in different ways and, and being productive as a company. You're, you, you as an agency, my company as a retail company, both, you know, digitals and store, digital and stores. So there's a, there's a lot of good to come out of it from that standpoint. And so that's, that's what I would, you know, suggest to the folks who are coming out of school or earlier in their career is to, to take those lessons to heart, you know, take stock and reflect a little bit uh, what, what did you learn? What did you get better at? What did you learn about yourself that you want to change in the next 12 months or 24 months? And then, you know, put a plan together and, and, and attack it. You got, you got to be very intentional about how you manage your career for the things you can control and then also be super adaptable for the things you can't control. Now, I like that word intentional. I also like uh, the term professional calluses. I like that as well because you're going to get your knees skinned. I like the fact that, and we hear this from a lot of the great leaders we interview, is that that, 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 that we all have a natural curiosity. We never want to stop learning. And, 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 and when I'm doing my interviews now with the radio and kids and everything, and I think you'll agree with me on this, the, the new litmus in hiring is going to be, what did you do to improve yourself or others during COVID? Mm-hmm. Did you binge watch, binge drink, binge game, binge sleep, which is fine. Or <laughs> did you learn a new skill? Did you, try to improve yourself? Did you try to apply that to your professional career? Did you try to apply that to help others? Because I think one thing that we're all going to learn coming out of this is empathy. You know, Frank, I don't know if we'll be able to measure the psychological or or mental impact uh, on society for many years coming out of this, because I know many days is that, you know, I'm like in solitary confinement at my home, even though I'm still running multiple businesses because I'm just doing it from the home and trying to motivate a staff from a virtual environment. But, but when this hit, I made a, I thought this thing was going to be over in 75 or 90 days. I'm like, this is the first break I've had in 40 years. I'm going to make a list of some things I want to do with my core business and myself and a -hmm. book and starting other companies and, and those types of things. And, and don't you, because what I try to explain to my students is, this is not a job application. You'll be shocked at how many generic resumes I get to careers at Melt. Hey, I'm Joe Smith. Here's my resume. I mean to make X amount of dollars. I don't even open the damn thing. It could be Elvis or the Pope <laughs> because you can find Frank Bracken or Vince Thompson on the internet and figure out, hey, you know, uh, go blue. Congrats on your success. I, I, you know, I want to understand how the retail is in, in, in changing environment. So it's a process. This is app. It's a, it's a it's a uh, it's an audition. You got about as much time to get Frank Bracken's attention as it does to pass a billboard on the interstate. Yeah. So so what are you looking for now? And entry level, or your executives are looking for, or and it's not even entry level because I'm hearing from all people all over the country right now. Yeah, I mean, 
more than ever, you're, you're looking for somebody that has the right attitude and the right values right, right off the bat. And, and you mentioned it, hey, what have you done for the last 12 months, you know, 12 months while COVID has shut us down? If, if you were out of work, what, what were you doing to make yourself better? Were you exercising and, and doing home workouts? Were you studying online? Were you reading books to get up to speed on a topic that you weren't as familiar with? Those things matter, right? I mean, anybody who thinks they're entitled to anything in today's world is going to be sadly disappointed because the competitive nature of one, a global economy, two, you know, an increasingly diverse workforce where women, where people of color have a, a better chance. We got a hell of a lot of work to go by all means, but that, that is only going to make the stakes and the competition that much more intense. And, and that's, that's fantastic. I think people have to challenge themselves and raise their mm -hmm. game and show what makes them different and what they bring to the table, whether that's skills, whether it's attitude, whether that's a, a new perspective, an innovative perspective, a diverse perspective, those things matter a lot. And as you think about building teams, you want to have that right chemistry of, you know, the ingredients we we're talking about Michigan basketball. I think that's one of the things that Juan Howard has done very well. He's assembled a lot of talent, but he's Love also it. built a culture and a chemistry and a, and a, and a brotherhood in this case that those guys support and believe in one another. And that's what you want to do in a, in a corporate setting as well. It's a little bit different, of course. The same principles apply. You want to have a common goal, a common vision. You want to have leadership. You want to have people who have different skill sets that are complementary. And you want people that get along and have a good time doing it and support one another. So there's a lot of parallels. And of course, that's probably why you and I are in the businesses we're in from, from sports into, into business. And I think you asked you know, some of the things that I think that made me successful and I lean on and, and a lot of them do go back to those early days as a kid and a teenager playing sports and team sports and understanding the role of the coach and understanding the role of your teammates and how you can be, you know, not just a winner, but a, a, a good teammate as well at the same time. Well, and, 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 you know, you brought up, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of these traits and, and, and again, and <clears throat> here's another theory of mine that I have is that, the job entry, the, the entry level job market. I used to say it'd take you like a fishing analogy, it'd take you a hundred casts to get eight job bites to get two really good job leads. Mm -hmm. I think now with unemployment and, 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 and people out of work are willing to take a lesser job for a lesser salary. It's going to take 500 casts to get eight, to get two. And, oh, and, 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 and it's that intangible and set preparation. And so, um, when you're looking for, you know, new and entry level employees. And so it's, so it's interesting. And I'll use an example. I interviewed uh, Michelle McKenna, who's the chief information officer of the NFL. Mm -hmm. And she says, I can't remember the last time I've hired somebody with a sports marketing background, mm -hmm. accounting, engineering, technology, coding, analytics, statisticians. We're trying to understand who everybody is that consumes NFL product. And I was like, wow, that's amazing because I had a tradition, you know, I went to be a, a sports writer and traditional journalist background, got lucky with sports information and got involved with the business of it. But what should, because, because Frank, here's the other thing. I think a lot of kids and parents are going to start challenging the traditional higher education model, mm -hmm. paying $50,000 to take, you know, an archaeology course from a Zoom camera in a dorm room that has absolutely nothing to do with a career at Foot Locker. So yep. what should these kids be doing to equip themselves to win a job within your organization now? Yeah, I think, look, one, you, you got to have some level of skill set, whether your skill set is selling and relating to people and being right. on the sales floor, whether you understand uh, data science and higher math concepts, and you can do data modeling and, and advanced algorithms and help you know, predict where consumers are going. Uh, or whether you have an operational and an engineering background and understand how to design warehouses and how to move a box from point A to B to C, you know, you've got to have some level of expertise there. And then it's definitely the softer skills. You've heard that, you know, theme come up many times. It's, right. it's what's your point of view on leadership? What's your point of view around being a teammate? How well do you communicate? How well do you live up to the things you said you were going to do uh, as a teammate? Uh, are you consistent? You know, how's your character? So th those things matter. And, th and the more you can show those things, whether it's a cover letter, an interview, or sometimes, you know, how, you know, fortune can shine on you and you bump into somebody or you hold the door for somebody and you say hi and go, hey, that's a nice lady or a nice man. Like, 
what are you doing? And you strike up a conversation and lo and behold, hey, I'm out of work or I'm interested in doing this or I've got a son right, who needs right. this. And you go, hey, have him give me a call. I mean, th those 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 circumstances never matter know. a lot. Yep, you never know, right? I mean, to your point, you can put out 500 or 5,000 cover letters that are generic, but you could have one personable, intimate interaction with somebody and, and just good circumstances bring you together and the rest is history, as they say. So, Well, you hit the nail on the head because, you know, um, uh, yeah, like I said, I was using that generic analogy versus leveraging emotional cues to get to Frank Bracken. So yeah. if they know you've had a great climb or they know you went to Michigan or Georgetown. Not only are you they striking that emotional chord, but they're showing you preparation. They're showing you, and I and I, I believe it's I, I I believe it's always been important, but I believe now the intangibles of getting the Frank Bracken's attention of the world are going to count more than ever now because not, not only that, we're all working in the virtual environment, but the standards, the classics really don't change. And that's what I tell the kids, like, bring the heat, yeah. be prepared, turn the damn phone off if you're in a virtual interview with, with, with Frank Bracken and, 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 and have a nice professional background. And you don't have to wear a coat and tie, but make yourself presentable and those types of things. And so, so uh, you know, uh, and, and, and you're, you know, you're, you're managing a major, massive workforce and, and digital transformation of your business and major retailers. And we don't know if people are going to go back to shopping malls. And I mean, like crazy stuff that we never would have had the conversation about five years ago. So in the spirit of all this, what gets your attention if a young kid is trying to track you down and they happen to get your attention on LinkedIn? What, what, what's that difference, difference maker? Yeah, I mean, one, you want to see some passion come through, whether it's an email or a conversation or a Zoom call or God forbid we can all get together again and you have an interaction. Right. You, you want to see some passion and some energy. Two, you want to see, like you hit it on the head, some attention to detail. Hey, I did a little bit of homework and I, I read this or I heard this or I thought that. You know, show that you de demonstrate that you thought about this conversation and this interview or this interaction we're going to have. And then third, just come prepared and have a story, right? Uh, people love a good story, whether it's a story about your career and how you got to this day, or whether it's a story that from your childhood about one day back in the summer, people love a good narrative and a good story. So be a good storyteller. I think the other thing you reminded me, you hit on a, a great term is just uh, overall, this idea of emotional intelligence is so important these days, Major. right? We, all, you, you nailed it. Education has become standardized, right? Everybody's got a college degree. Everybody's done their four years. Everybody's got, you know, certifications, et cetera. But this, the, the differentiator now is emotional intelligence and being able to read a room, read a relationship, read a conversation and understand what's, what's being said without being said, right? Or what body language means or, hey, Frank said he liked that, but you know, the tone wasn't there. I think I need to double back and do a little bit of more homework and come back and make sure I have his support. Like, those are the things that impress and that, and that distinguish and differentiate people over time. And, and, and you can pick up like my, my youngest daughter, who's only nine years old. I mean, her, her emotional intelligence is off the charts because she reads me and plays me like nobody's business. Right. So she, right. She's got that life skill. God, God love her already. But right. uh, there, there are others who are brilliant. They, they literally are brilliant people, but just don't have that ability to interact with others or interpret or communicate. And I've seen people at very high levels and including my, my own company who are, who are no longer here, but they just didn't have that ability to network and connect and communicate and get on with others. And so th that's the key differentiator these days because I mean, you've got people through outsourcing, through technology now. I mean, hey, if I need you know engineering or coding or IT, I can go to India, I can go to Hong Kong and go to China. I can go a lot of places, right. but you can't replace personality. You can't replace connectivity and emotional intelligence and passion. I I I want to impact. I want to unpack that emotional intelligence a little more because what I I I, I preach I, I, I preach to these students. I'm like, find that connection point. Find that low hanging fruit. And think about it. You and I hadn't talked for many years. The first three things I say, uh, you know, is hey, go blue. How's your family and where are you living? Mm -hmm. You didn't have a damn thing to anything, but but right. but but your your emotional cues and your and your welfare. And I think that uh, that emotional intelligence is going to carry uh, the day because you know, like I said, I mean, you know, it, it, it we don't know when we're going to come back to offices. Will we come back to offices? Will we come back to 
uh, shopping malls, you know, will we go back to theaters? And, and I think, but, but, but on the other side of it, I really do believe that this generation has an opportunity for it to be um, a golden uh, era for them, but yeah. they're going to have to think differently. And I, you know, and, and I will tell you an interesting thing is that I found some in my workforce that just weren't comfortable shedding their skin. Mm -hmm. and and because we're an event marketing agency and i started asking them to do things that were not within that norm and i have a saying that says change is inevitable growth is optional choose wisely because i said look if we don't evolve ourselves and shed our skin we're dead because mm -hmm. our core business our, our industry had been devastated and i said but it'll come back but in the meantime let's take advantage of it let's keep some gas in the tank and and i'm sure that you are experiencing that yourself is that, and I tell our students all the time, and, and you can talk about this a little bit as well, because I've, you know, I've been involved in your career for a long time, and, and we all know it now, life is not linear, is it not? No, sir, no, sir. Hey, and being vulnerable and, and showing sensitivity right. or even weakness in a moment is, is not a bad thing, and oftentimes it's a very good thing, because again, it goes back to connecting with people and saying, hey, I didn't quite understand that, or I'm having a bad day, and you know, with, with all that's happened in the last year, people have plenty of built-in reasons to not have had a good day or to be off their game, right? And I think being honest and authentic about that is, is really important because you can fake it, uh, but but that only lasts you so long. And I think some of the, the best conversations and the most meaningful relationships are formed through tough conversations, whether that's, you know, uh, adversity or whether that's having a challenging situation that you all have to work through together um, the, the, those things can form, those, those interactions can form really strong bonds over time that, that pay dividends. You know, if you and I, we didn't always see eye to eye back at Coke when we got started, right? But we worked it out and here we are 16, 18 years later, right. chopping it up and, and talking about, you know, the last two decades of our careers, which is, hey, that's a good thing, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and um, yeah, so, the, so I totally agree that having vulnerabilities and, and being able to to be sensitive and to, to react to things and, and, and be um, flexible is super, super important. Well, and, and, and you hit on a, a couple of things that, that I want you to talk about. Um, and I wish I had learned this lesson a lot earlier in my career um, is that you just can't take anything personal. You can't, I mean, you, 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 people say, you know, what business am I in? I'm in the rejection business, but NO is not the, the they don't spell no, it's the first two letters and not yet. And there's, because now particularly, like, you don't know when somebody's having a bad day. Like, you know, like, like, did they have COVID? Did they lose a loved one? Did their parents, are they worried about their parents? Like, 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 but I, like I said, I've made some of my worst professional mistakes of, of taking no personally when it had, that decision had absolutely nothing to do with me or the work I had displayed out there. It was just wrong set of circumstances and timing. And, and I mean, even you're the CEO, you got bosses, you get told no, you've got consumers, they go somewhere else and shop, but you just, what's your philosophy on not taking this personal? Cause then I want to tie it into the importance of mentorships and not just having a mentor that's going to, you know, rub your head and pat your belly. They're going to give you that tough love when they need to give it to you. Yeah. Hey, sometimes no is no. And sometimes no just means not yet, or maybe just not yet. Right. So having that perseverance and if you've got a strong point of view or conviction about what it is you're pitching, whether that's yourself for a job or an idea at work to your boss, maybe the first answer is no. Maybe the second answer is no. Take the feedback, take the input, go back, evolve it, spin it into something di different and better, and then come back to the table and, and pitch it again. And I think people, whether or not that idea itself gets you know approved per se, they're going to be very, very impressed with you saying, hey, that person had the fortitude and the perseverance to go back, rework it, the humility to rethink it, take my feedback, very intelligent, came back with solutions and ideas that address that. And, and, and that serves people very well, too, that, that adaptability and responsiveness, you know, for sure. Well, it's interesting. We uh, we interviewed Josh Brooks, who's the new athletic director at the University of Georgia yesterday. Mm -hmm. And as he said, as he was, you know, um, uh, athletic director at Millsaps College, uh, and he got his you know hands dirty. He understood everything about concession stands and you know restrooms and security and all that. But also, he was on a, a, a panel with uh, the other athletic directors within the the um, the conference he was in, and and he was somewhat of a disruptor. But when he came in to argue something on his behalf of the school, 
he was fully prepared and he presented himself in a respectful manner. And even though some of his colleagues disagreed and voted against him, they came up after came up to him after and said, you know what, we disagree with your point of view on this one, but you were so professional, so prepared. We're mm -hmm. going to keep an open mind when you come back the next time. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. Especially in the broader context of what's going on and politics and media and the world uh, writ large, it's it's obviously a, a fairly divisive time, right? It has been for the last several years and it's easy to get torqued up and get aggressive and, you know, double down on your point of view, but, you know, showing some humility and showing some understanding and empathy right. for the other side is super important. And again, it goes back to that, those, those soft skills that you need to develop. And you know, I can remember many times early in my career, running hot, sending an email, making a call, leaving a message that, you know, now I look back, I'd be embarrassed to read the transcript. I, I, no, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm poster child. It, it, it embarrasses yeah. me. Yep. Well, you know, and you, you find a way to channel that energy and passion and be more productive with it, right? In terms of, of playing the long game and just learning to be a little more calm in situations and take a breath. And like you said, you don't know if a no or a yes is coming out, but you got to be prepared for both outcomes and, and handle both with, the same temperament and the same humility and the same graciousness. So, so that's really important too. But um, yeah, you know, you, you brought up this thing of, of just understanding that, um, you know, no today doesn't mean that it's going to be no tomorrow. And, and, and again, I go back to this idea of persevering and, and finding solutions and finding other doors that you can open to, to get to a yes. And that, that may be a different company or a different interview or a different product concept that you're pitching um, but, but certainly don't give up. I mean, if, if you have that attitude that, hey, if, uh, if I'm turned down or if I, I run into a wall that I'm just going to throw my hands up and pout, like that, that, that obviously is not good for you. It's not good for your teammates. It's not good for anybody. So, and early on in your career, it, it is easy to, to let your passion for a project get mistaken and, and convert it into negative energy. And you got to just be careful and, and manage that. Right. Um, so, you know, we know you're busy and we got to wrap this thing up, but we always just, we just always like to ask our, you know, our guests at the level, you know, the, the, the any, any, any kind of philosophy or sayings or, or books or podcasts that, 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 you know, we've heard a lot of great ones. And, you know, obviously mm -hmm. you've been a, you know, you're obviously a student uh, at three of the most prestigious places in the world and, 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 and major brands, any, any, any words of wisdom or, or resources that you'd like to share with our kids? Cause uh, they really, like I said, they love to hear it from the masters. Um, yeah. you know, they're getting great academic education, but people who have really, um, you know, have really, have really done it. And you've got a, you know, you've got a long way to go, you know, up the ladder. So uh, any words of wisdom? Yeah. So, you know, you asked earlier about, you know, we talked a little bit about patience, right. And just having patience in your career and what, what, how much success to expect, how quickly. It's, it's, very, um, it's very easy to get romanticized with this idea that, hey, if I just start a company, start an agency, start a new retail company, <laughs> success is gonna come. Cause it is so easy to, you can write up an LLC, put your website up and start doing business tomorrow. It doesn't mean you've got a great business plan. So, and, and I don't know if, um, you know, this guy, Professor Scott Galloway at NYU, he's written some, some books recently around the, the big four, the big five, the tech companies and the uh -huh. future dominance of them. Um, but, but he also, you know, shared this idea of uh, financial wisdom. You know, best way to get rich is time, diversification and compound interest, right? And I think that that principle applies to your career as well, right? That's a great point. Time, diversity of experience and let those experiences compound over time and get better over time. So, you know, again, it goes back to the theme of patience. You can be deliberate in terms of the experiences, the education, the places you take your career, but also be open to the opportunities that present themselves, both good and bad. Learn through those, learn through those experiences, get better, and, and over time it compounds into something, you know, really, really powerful. You know, I like that. So, so being on the front lines of, um, of consumer behavior and, you know, operating in multiple states and cities and, and locations, do you, do you, your experts and your gut, do you tell, does it tell you that maybe Labor Day, that, that things are going to be, it will never be quote unquote normal again, but for, for some reason, I'm starting to feel a little positivity in the marketplace. So you, are you sensing that as well within? Well, I mean, you know, hey, certainly the fact that there's, three vaccines out there now and the supply seems to have improved in the last 30 days or so gives us a little bit of hope and optimism. You know, I'm not, I'm not a prognosticator in that, in that regard, but 
you know, there will be a point in time when it gets back to, to normal. I think it is going to be a new normal. You know, I live in uh, near New York City in Hoboken. We were talking earlier about that. You know, the experience, the life experience in New York City and Manhattan is going to be different than it is in mm-hmm. Sarasota or Miami or Dallas, Texas. So I think that that's going to influence it, too, in the short term in terms of, you know, do you commute on a train or a bus or do you take a car into work or do you just end up staying home and, and, and working virtually? So, look, I, I, I'm, I'm an optimist at heart. I think all of us are. That's what keeps us in the game and keeps right. us going. So I, I do see the uh, the end of the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel, and I, I think it's going to get better. Certainly by the end of the year, and if it does sooner, then then I'll be the first one to to be out there and shaking hands and and making oh, relationships shit. again. Um, do you see the uh, uh, the home exercise fitness craze? How yes. has that impacted your business? Yeah, big time. So so we. Um, we have a brand called East Bay, which I'm sure you must have grown up as an athlete. Oh, yeah. Something from the East Bay catalog. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, we're digital now. You'd be happy to know. But uh, but yeah, so just in the last sort of 60 days alone, easy triple digit growth in all of our fitness and training and equipment categories. So devices, uh, weights, uh, exercise bands, uh, compression apparel. Uh, sports bras, all of those categories up, easy triple digits, which is just a reflection. Yeah, people not necessarily going out to the gyms, but finding a, a new home fitness routine yeah, right. closer to home. So here's a question, because my girlfriend uh, just bought uh, a Peloton treadmill. And then yeah. literally the thing is like a spaceship. I mean, yeah. it's unbelievable. But I'm going to take it back uh, because I've, I've bought exercise equipment in the past uh, probably around, right around the new year. And then it wound up being expensive coat hanger. Will Peloton ultimately be the most expensive coat hanger in the planet or can this sustain itself? Because they had a supply and demand issue and she had a very poor customer service experience, but will the standards go back to, you know, Hey, I've I've got this, I mean, she's got a $5,000 spaceship in her house right now. Yes. Well, Peloton is our uh, is our business neighbor on 34th Street, New York. So I'm I'm fond of them, and I, I like the story of their, their brand and company. It's amazing. The, the the thing that they've done extremely well though is they have built a community and they built that digital connectivity right through their monthly subscription service and all the classes that they right. uh, have developed and all these sort of celebrity trainers who come on and get you fired up to take the next class. They've woven in music and energy and culture into it. So I think you know where we were 10 years ago, where it would have been a, 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 an unconnected or just a physical piece of machinery. It's now a connected digital device that's part of a lifestyle and there's a movement. So I like their chances. I, so I think you, think it's it's, so you do think it's, you think it's sustainable? Oh yeah. And I think that brand's going to scale into probably other devices. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't, right. I don't, uh, you know, follow them or have any insider information, but I'm, I'm sure they're trying to innovate and figure out whether it's uh a wristwatch or a sport watch or some well, other. They did acquire device. somebody. They did treadmills, right? So they've gone from yeah. bikes to treadmills. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what next or the next natural extension is, but I'm sure that their engineering yeah. and innovation teams are, are working on it right well, now. Well, that, that I was, I mean, first of all, the thing weighs like 400 pounds. Secondly, I was just like, this thing is like, like literally like as nice as a car. And, uh, but again, that long tail phenomenon, and it was coming before the uh, pandemic, but I mean, that only benefits your business, right? Yeah, I think uh, we've had two major sort of trends that have, have helped us. One, one is the fitness one that you talked about, that people are reinvigorated and wanting to work out mostly at home. So they're buying and having, you know, products shipped to their home or, or they're right. still coming out to the stores. The other is just the casualization of, of work from home, right? You and I, I'm looking right. at you on screen right now. You're wearing a nice track suit and a polo shirt. So people aren't wearing, you know, formal pants and dress shoes and button downs. Um, they're, they're wearing t-shirts and I'm wearing a Nike dry fit right now and a pair of compression shorts. And so that, that was, you know, good for our business, not to mention the sneaker side of it on, on right. footwear. So, <laughs> well, you'll get a kick out of this. I said this on a radio interview uh, uh, and we'll wrap up and let you go, but do you know what the loneliest job in the country is right now? Uh, I know there, you got a joke coming for me. So no, what is it? It's the, it's the salesman at Joseph bank. because <laughs> yeah. It's like the Maytag man now. And because there's one right across the street from my office and they're yeah. literally like throwing the jackets out on Peach street. Just, just say, please take one. We'll pay you to take one because, yeah. and, and by the way, 
I was not wearing a, uh, I'd wear a nice sport jacket to dinner or to the office, but I, I, I can't, I don't remember the last time I've had a tie on. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure that, that anybody will go back to that short of maybe some of the, the, the traditional businesses. But again, uh, lifestyle, personal, professional shift is only going to benefit your, your future, you know, long term. And, and, you know, maybe a year or two ago, there's not a prognosticator in the planet. Uh, that would have predicted this and they had it, you probably would have thrown them out of the office because that, you know, I'm seeing that when I go, I was getting thrown out of boardrooms a year ago and now they're like, well, hey, maybe that's not such a bad, that's such a yeah. bad idea. But so the, uh, the CEO of, uh, of Gap just yesterday, I was reading an article and I apologize if I forgot her name, was talking about, she, she sees a rebound. She thinks that this idea of business casual, a little more formal wear is going to, she called it peacocking, that people are going to want to come out of their homes and, and spread their wings and show off their new yeah. clothes and so, so maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I mean, unless they had a COVID body that didn't go the right way. Yeah. So, so, so there's that perspective. You know, I, I tend to believe that once, once you get comfortable and once, you know, you, you find a new lane that it's kind of hard to give that up. So I, I kind of like this idea that. of casualization of, in the comfort of people. And there, there's definitely going to be innovation within that. So I think even sneakers, if you look at sneaker and the business wear in, you know, so, some of the shoes that we sell are spaceships, like quite literally, right. With, uh, yeah with automated lacing mechanisms and incredible soul technology and comfort and performance and design. Yeah. So, so, uh, but back to your point about was a men's warehouse, Joseph A. Banks, like, you know, that's a case study and just the business model and just not reading the trends. Now, again, I I'll forgive them for no one predicted COVID, but certainly you saw the casualization and the increase right. in fitness and sneaker culture and being more comfortable and not responding to that through your assortment and merchandise was, was clearly a, a big, big mistake. Well, it also is, it's, it's funny that it, it, like, um, and I'm not a huge sneakerhead. My son's a big sneakerhead, but like, but, but, but sneakers are the new dress shoes now. And I mean, yeah. and, and, and the brands yeah. that you see, um, <clears throat> and so it just, you know, and you, you see this collectible boom and you see, you know, on cloud and all these crazy things. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's still just, you know, tip of the lululemon i mean just the tip of the iceberg so i mean you're getting you're getting compliments and competitors coming at you that you never would have envisioned three four yeah. five years ago well you're and, you're a you're a sneakerhead Vinny. you just don't know it yet so i'm gonna get your size and send you a cool pair of sneakers after this call and you, oh you'll, man you'll that's a I, nobody's tonight. ever offered me anything for free i'm usually the one giving it to my ex-wife so uh <laughs> No comment. <laughs> so that's that between one. you and her. No yeah, comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we got we have a good we have a good relationship. But anyway, uh, Frank Bracken, my dear friend. Uh, I think you guys can see uh, why he's been wildly successful uh, and can, will continue to be successful. I'm I'm, I'm anxious to see uh, his continued evolution because every every once in a while I'd say, well, you, you know, Frank Bracken's been promoted to Canada or, or Champs or Foot Locker or uh, you know being the a CEO of a, of a major retailer, major sports retailer, and working on a lot of the most vaunted brands in the world. I'm sure you're going to hear from a lot of our, our listeners. And uh, I'm hoping that you and I uh, uh, get to do some fun things together again, because we, 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 we did shake them up pretty good. Me and you in a room were pretty good disruptors and, uh, Absolutely. Uh, and, 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 and test a lot of people and a lot of, a lot of great Coke alumni are doing a lot of great things across the, uh, across the country now. And, you know, Todd Smith at, at Traeger and, you know, William White at Walmart and Maurice Cooper at Target. I mean, just a lot of tremendous. It's Alex incredible. Williams. I look, I look back at the, uh, yeah. my, my fellow alumni from that Coke sort of era that I was there and you named some of the folks and it is, it is very impressive to see where these folks. Have been it's cra it, it is literally crazy. And, and I will tell you, representing Coke, as long as I have talking about the value of maintaining your relationships is that most of my business leads and any of my businesses are from the Coke alumni network. Just yeah. maintaining touch, maintaining trust, maintaining credibility. Uh, right. you know, one of the biggest wins we had uh, in our history was Athlac, and it was Shannon Watkins who ran Powerade. Yeah. And, uh, and well, hey, so, you forwarded me that NIL athlete newsletter, and I forwarded that onto my team and said, yeah. "Guys, we need to have a point of view. The, the the earth is changing beneath our feet as we speak, and we got to have a point of view and understand what the opportunity is." And yeah, it's coming. Anytime it there's a coming. big change, there's. It's you know, massive. It's hard to predict, but it is going to change the and I, landscape of sports sponsorship and asset and celebrity for sure. I think it's long overdue. And I think that where I'm bullish about it is brands that have may have, have either advertised in sports or college sports or peripherally, but maybe, you know, maybe hadn't really thought about it or now saying, Hey, I'm going after the new money. So for instance, you know, 
Kimberly Clark, they have female, they, they have female products. They never would have million years. They're not going to buy an ad on game day, but so now all of a sudden they're like, you know, Hey, there's a lot of these empowered female athletes out there that we'd like to put our hands in the, the product in the hands of. Uh, and I think it's going to be a salvation for these sports and for these Olympic sports, because a lot of athletic departments are trimming their budgets post COVID and now it might be an opportunity to really, you know, put some money in these athletes' pockets as well as um, save their teams. And I, you know, I, I think that you know, Foot Locker, East Bay, uh, could be on the forefront of that. But even from a lifestyle, I think the, their families who've sacrificed for many years. You know, you you run into families who commit their entire lives to helping their kids with swimming or softball or volleyball mm-hmm. or youth baseball. And um, I, I just I believe it's it's the biggest business opportunity in college sports in, in 50 years and long overdue. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest opportunity is for the Michigan football team to win a natty and bring that home to Ann Arbor, but uh, may, maybe both of those statements can be true. Well, I, um, I'm, uh, I can't say anything because, uh, you know, Auburn and, and we just paid Gus Malzahn 21.5 million to, mm-hmm. to, to fail. And then he goes and gets another job, but uh it's good for college football when uh, when the when the Wolverines and 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 Harbaugh are winning, but hey, they're sticking it out with him, you know. And yeah. uh, and then maybe you know, Juwan will have uh, some positive influence. Jim Harbaugh is a good coach. I mean, you know, he's won at every level. So, uh, it, but it is yeah, like good. I said earlier, I'm a, I'm an optimist at heart. So spring uh, spring ho- goes eternal here, as they say. So it's a new season. Teams out on the field practicing already. Yeah, of course, all the preseason hype is positive. But why would it be otherwise? And so we'll see come fall, you know, but back to your question, ho- hopefully things are opened up and the guys can play with fans in the stands and family in the stands and, you know, we'll watch it on TV. Yeah, well, I think it's going to be uh, incredible. Just uh, I think fall is going to be unbelievable. Like, and, and, and uh, but yeah, you know, when Michigan wins, Ohio State, Notre Dame, Alabama, uh, that's why we love college sports so much. And, and, and again, back to that emotional connection. You know, you're mm-hmm. always going to have that emotional uh, connection to the Wolverines and hopefully your children will have it as well. And, and um, uh, my son, I'm working on it. I'm yeah, working well, on it. But like well, I said, my, they're, they're smart. So they know, they know to tease me about the Buckeyes already. And, no, and they, 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 they know yeah, where, they so know where you're, they know where you're, uh, they know my pain your buttons, and yeah. how to push my buttons. Yeah. They're, they're smart. Like I but said. listen, um, we thank you for your time. It was great to catch up uh, and uh, uh, just some tremendous words of wisdom. And I hope I get to see you soon. And maybe we'll sneak off to Indian, Indianapolis. You never know. Hey, I'm not saying no just yet. But, uh, <laughs> my best yeah, so to what, you, my yeah. best to your son, Carter. I can't believe he's a sophomore, George. That's incredible to think. But uh, hey, that's awesome for you guys. So yeah. my best. It's good to see you healthy right. and happy. And I'd right. uh, love to catch up anytime. All right. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for the students of Melt University Virtual. Thanks, Vince. We hope you've enjoyed today's virtual class. We'll be back soon with a new edition of Melt University 2021.